Uh, my name is Jim Legman, and uh, today is April 19th, 2011. We're at Fairhope Library in Fairhope, Alabama, and we're here to interview Mr. Russ Bartlett. It's part of the Veterans History Project, which is sponsored by the Library of Congress. Mr. Bartlett is a World War II veteran. He was born uh, in 1920. He served uh, during the years 1942 to 1945 in the U.S. Army Air Corps. I believe I have all that correct. Right? That's correct. Okay, so I guess we should start by with a little of your background, your early childhood, growing up years, and uh, where you uh, where you were born, etc. I was born in Springfield, Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. Lived there for about seven or eight years, and he moved to Waterbury, Connecticut. My dad mm -hmm. started a new business. Mm -hmm. I lived there until I went in the military. Mm -hmm. And what did your dad do? He had a photo engraving business. Mm -hmm. And so did you have some kind of, were you working? Did you have some kind of occupation uh, before you joined? Oh yes. Well, as a kid, dad started this new business and then 29 and 30 the bank starts closing. We had a quite a disaster in our family. Uh -huh. And mother was quite a baker, cook. And she'd bake bread and biscuits, and we three kids would go out and try and sell it to help balance the family budget. Mm -hmm. I never did know how bad it was until many years later. I learned from my dad and mom mm -hmm. how rough it was. But we survived mm -hmm. and came on through. And how old were you at this time? Ten. Ten. And how old were you when you joined the military? Or were you drafted? No, I, I volunteered. Why did you volunteer? Well, I, rather than be drafted, I volunteered. I wanted, okay. I wanted to fly, so. <laughs> right, uh, you would have been drafted into the Army. Uh, yes, I yes, see. my brother was already in. He went in for a year in 1940, whatever it was, and he got stuck in. He, he didn't get out after his one year. He stayed as a career? Oh, no, no, he didn't. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> So did you have any other family members? I had a younger sister. And but any others in the military? No, just my brother and myself. I see. So, and uh, so why the Air Corps? Well, I'd always been interested in aviation. Mm -hmm. It fascinated me. I made model airplanes and so forth. And I watched people like uh, Jimmy Doodle flying the Laird 400. And mm -hmm. that was fascinating. I met the fellow, I can't think of the name right now, who flew the first uh, GB aircraft out of Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. and it was quite an airplane. Jimmy Doodle did fly that too, actually. Is that right? Mm -hmm. okay. So how old were you when you, enli when you enlisted? Twenty-two. Twenty-two. Mm -hmm. And where did you go to uh, basic training? Maxwell Field, Alabama. Really? <laughs> and how long was that? I don't remember for sure, two or three months. It was mm -hmm. all pre-flight stuff, getting organized in the military. What were the conditions like? Was it pretty hectic with the war effort? Uh, well, it was very strict discipline. Of course, we had to walk in certain parts of the sidewalk at a certain rate of speed. and. Uh, you were a cadet. I was a pre-cadet. Pre and all of these disciplinary with one stripe they had control, I understand. Yes, yes. <laughs> then I went to flight training for uh -huh. three phases. Mm -hmm. Any difficulties getting through the basic or? No. Mm -hmm. Just follow orders and you'll be all right. You know that. Sure, sure. What about flight training then? Where did you go to? I started primary flight training in um, Camden, South Carolina at a commercial base. And of course, the military took over the commercial base. We mm -hmm. flew PT-17s, Stearman's, mm -hmm. good little airplane, mm -hmm. very durable. Was that your initial training airplane? Yes. And what about later? Did you? Well, then from there, we graduated from there, we went on up to uh, Macon, Georgia, and flew BT-13s and BT-15s for basic mm -hmm. training. Mm -hmm. That was for about I think it was around 60 to 90 days, I don't remember for sure. Mm -hmm. And then we went on to Mariana, Florida for advance in our mm -hmm. commission. And did, did you get instrument qualified at that time? Or? 
Well, the basic instruments, yes, not really uh, weather instruments, no. All right. Later, I went to instrument school after I'd done some flying for a while, and uh, we were it's very, very strict and rigid up in St. Joe, Missouri, St. Joseph. And uh, we got our green card, the white card and the green card. We got them both. I don't we, know what those are. Well, it's uh, the white card gives you instrument rating. You can fly on instruments uh -huh. with clearance. Green card is you can sign your own clearance and take off and fly in any weather if you're crazy uh -huh. enough. I see. Uh, so I had a lot of instrument time. Yeah, so you got your civilian rating at the same time. It was. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I see. And do you know how many hours you got in each of these airplanes, or how long this process of the, the, your entire pilot training was? Let's see, I went in. Start. About 10 months, I think it was. Mm -hmm. Did you ever scare yourself in pilot training? I had a ground loop in our PT-17 one time right in front of operations. That's just, scary. Yeah, just spin around. <laughs> it didn't know the damage were done. Yeah, that's scary. It's but the only one then, after I got to come into military flying, then I uh -huh. had some scares. Uh-huh. I see. So you had flight training. Did you do any, have any other specialized training? Uh, did you have to go to survival school or? Uh, no, you didn't not until later. Uh -huh. We went uh, from, after I graduated, they sent me to uh, Milwaukee for classification and they took a group of us, we were all single engine pilots, they took us a group of us and I was sent to Brownsville, Texas to fly a scope out for a, a, a um, service pilot. We flew Texas to Panama once. Yeah. About every 10 days, round trip, every country in Central America. Mm -hmm. And Panama and Turnaround came back. It was yeah. a three day, three trip, three day trip. And uh, I did that for three or four months. Four or five months, I guess that was. And I was transferred to uh, Memphis, Tennessee. And I flew Copilot again with American Airlines service pilots. We flew from Memphis to New York and from Memphis to El Paso, different routes, back and forth. Mm -hmm. Of course, I like going to New York because I lay over and go home. <laughs> That's good. What type of aircraft? Commercial DC-3s. Mm -hmm. The Goonie Bird. Mm -hmm. Good airplane. Uh, uh -huh. And I ferried. I went to instrument school. And I flew. Uh, we delivered B-25s out of the factory in Kansas City and delivered them all over the country. Mm -hmm. Hunterfield, Georgia, Los Angeles, and so forth. Mm -hmm. and, and from there they'd be ferried overseas? Uh, well, wherever they wanted to use them, I don't know. Mm -hmm. We did check out we, our crew. We flew into, I think it was Hunterfield, Georgia one time, and uh, they wanted us to start flying a B-26, deliver mm -hmm. that somewhere. We took it off, we got checked out in the 26, but Fortunately, a 25 came along to go to California, so we went to California. But the 26, the poor guys that flew that, they crashed and got killed. Uh -oh. So we were very grateful for that opportunity. Mm -hmm. And then, where do I go next? So were you... I guess, not, that's when I went to instrument school. Mm -hmm. And then I came back from instrument school and uh, I was... Classified a tw twin engine pilot, anyhow. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, we, uh, I was sent to West Palm Beach, Florida, and put on the, see, I had a C 47 assigned to me, DC 3 in essence, and uh, we trained there for about two weeks, and we took off and flew to Puerto Rico. Mm -hmm. And from Puerto Rico, we flew to um, I can put it on the map, I can't do the name, but uh, Guyana in South Guyana, America, sure. British mm -hmm. Guyana. And from there we flew to Natal, Brazil. We'd lay over each stop. And uh, from Natal, I was given a navigator. And we took off at midnight one night and we flew to Ascension Island. And we hit some weather and we came down. The navigator was very good. He came down, 
broke out of the clouds and the earth run away in front of us. That one little island in the middle of South Atlantic. And what was the purpose of these flights? Distance. Mm -hmm. Fuel capacity. I see. And uh, then from there, it flew across to Africa, just where the bulge of Africa comes back around, mm -hmm. cuts in. We flew into that area and went on down to Guyana, the town of Accra. And uh, the interesting thing I had high, high memories about was when he hit the Africa coast, we were going inland a little bit along, you know, land along the coastal area, and I saw a native village. I, was, I dropped down a little lower. I saw this native village and I had my 16 millimeter camera with me. And so I, what was fascinating about the village, it was a small village that had a wall around it. it looked like it was made out of corn stalks. I don't know what it was for truth. And the fascinating thing to me was two men in blue flowing robes on white horses when I came down low, they went out into the fields and rounded up all the people to bring them back in. So I circled two or three times and mm -hmm. took a lot of film, but I never saw the film because the so-called censors thought it was mil too, too militaristic. Okay. But uh, uh, I asked for it later and they, oh, nobody ever heard of it, and so I was out of luck. Mm -hmm. And when I went into uh, a crawl and spent three or four days there and had a wonderful time at the beach swimming in the Atlantic. And we flew from there. If I had a map, I could point out the cities better. Mm -hmm. uh, two or three stops across Central Africa mm -hmm. into Khartoum. It, at that time, it was Anglo-Egyptian Sudan. Mm -hmm. We had a big dust storm there on the desert. We had to cover up our engine and so forth. And we spent an extra day or two there. And we went on to the um, town of Aden in Yemen. And across the southern part of the uh, Arabian Peninsula to another little town in Orm, Orna. And we hit a, we were up 9,000 feet and we hit a terrible swarm of birds, mm. or locusts, I'm not sure which, I don't remember for sure. Because I'm getting old and my memory's slipping. <laughs> and then we went into Karachi. Yeah, it was India at the time, it wasn't Pakistan. Mm -hmm. We spent two days there and they said, if you want to stop here, you better buy some shoes, they're cheap. So I had two pair of sh shoes made to order overnight. Mm -hmm. Wonderful, wonderful leather, handmade. Mm -hmm. I had a pair of jobbers and a pair of half boots, half high, mm -hmm. and uh, very reasonable. Mm -hmm. We flew from there, we flew across India. We stopped the Taj Mahal for a quick visit, and went on into uh, a town called Silhat, which is in the um, northeast corner of India. Which, if you see the map of Bangladesh, now it's just east of Bangladesh, because mm -hmm. Bangladesh comes up here in India, mm -hmm. and the Himalayas are up here, so mm -hmm. it's just a little bit of India there. Mm -hmm. We were based in Silhat for a while, and the, uh, I have to stop and think a minute. The, uh, British troops were based on the Burma, India Burma border. They were fighting the Japanese. The Japanese were beginning to invade India mm -hmm. on the western, eastern edge, mm -hmm. and uh, we supplied all the troops. Mm -hmm. There are no roads in there. The uh, Lido Road had not been built yet. It started, but it would have to go back and forth through the mountains, get over the first foothills there, so called. and. Uh, so we flew all the supplies in there, and we flew supplies to Murrow's Marauders and so forth, mm -hmm. airdrop supplies. Mm -hmm. And we finally got to you into a, a town called Mishinaw, Burma. Mm -hmm. It's in North Burma, it's the biggest village. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was a little strip there, very little. And they had, I think they had six P-40s based there. They were bombing the town. It was interesting. They'd take off, make a left turn, circle on here, bomb the town, come back, make a turn, come back and land. Mm -hmm. Six minutes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so we flew in all the equipment to build, a, build that airport. It was less mm -hmm. than 3,000 feet long at first. Mm -hmm. and they made it a 5,000 foot strip. And later they built three more airports there. Mm -hmm. Finally, um, the one they built went across the Uruguay River there, and that's where I was based in the fighter outfit. Mm 
Mm -hmm. We did all the drop supplies for food and ammunition, picked up the injured, and brought them to hospitals or wherever they had to go. Mm -hmm. We went into China. Um, a little town called Paris. You know, I didn't go into uh, what's the name of that town. I can't think of the name of the town. The uh, troop carrier boys, not troop carrier, the air, air transport command. They used to fly into this town in China, bringing all the oil, the oil barrels, yeah. mm -hmm. and uh, we flew everything you could imagine. Um, they beat up our airplanes, getting equipment in and out of it, and we even floor the back door off for many, many, many months. This is the infamous pump operation, right? Yes. Uh-huh. And mm -hmm. uh, I took off one time with a, a load that rolled back a little bit, it was about a seven or 8,000 pound load instead of a 5,000, and I took off with four degrees nose trim. Mm -hmm. And I landed with a four degrees nose trim, which is unheard of. You didn't do weight and balance. <laughs> oh yeah, no, no, my load nope. moved. It wasn't mm -hmm. wasn't anchored properly. Uh -huh. It moved back. Mm -hmm. I pushed the throttle and started rolling. Mm -hmm. Did they weight and balance your airplane? Uh, they didn't know what that know? was. I know that's what I thought. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Whatever they uh -huh. get in with a reasonable uh -huh. guess, they did, put in. Did you stay within max gross weights most of the time? Oh, we're overloaded all the time. That's what I thought. Oh yeah, always overloaded. And could you get over? One time we, one of the fellows. There's four of us fellows at Cruz that did that. And uh, one fella couldn't, he parked with his tail wheel turned. He couldn't straighten it out because the load was too heavy. <laughs> we were way over the load. 8,000 pounds were supposed to carry 5,500. We had 8,000 pounds in a lot of the time. But, but then you were altitude limited, I'm sure. Uh, could you get over the mountains or did you have to Well, they weren't that high right there. Mm -hmm. We didn't have to get much over. Mm -hmm. Uh, six or eight thousand. This was in the C-46 or 47? 47. 47. No. Uh -huh. I did check out in the 46, but I didn't like flying it. Yeah. It was too vulnerable. Uh -huh. It crashed. I lost quite a few. I had some friends who were with the ATC, and uh, I lost six friends. Mm -hmm. They weren't good in bad weather. Mm -hmm. The monsoon weather, um, miserable. You don't see the sun for, at any altitude for three or four months at a time. I read in one of the articles that uh, if you could see the end of the runway, you were expected to take off. Was that true? Worse than that. Oh, okay. <laughs> half, if you see half the runway, go. Oh yes. Pre-dawn, take off. 100, yeah. foot, 100 foot or less sailing. And could you get above the weather then? No. Uh, very often. So you had to fly instruments. Oh, a lot, yeah. You could get above it sometimes. You got 10,000, mm -hmm. you get it. Mm -hmm. above 10,000. But if you were in Vietnam, didn't you have monsoons? Oh, absolutely. I, yeah. we know currents. I know the wind, the currents must have been vicious up there. Yes, it, yes. And especially in the wintertime. We had one plane take off uh, sometime later as a C-54, an air transport command plane. It took off from Mission Alberta there, that strip we were building, and uh, he got about 3,500 feet, and all of a sudden went to 20,000. Mm -hmm. Flipped over his back. He he, he passed out briefly, mm -hmm. and you can imagine that. Mm -hmm. And uh, they start diving. He pulled out about 3,500 feet, mm -hmm. landed went back and landed at the airport. They took off from, and they junked the airplane. Mm -hmm. All the fairing between the fuselage and the wings and so forth that was all torn off. The mm -hmm. rudder was bent. Mm -hmm. The wings were bent, mm -hmm. and they trashed the airplane mm -hmm. just from that storm. I've been knocked around oh, like this. Mm -hmm. you, you know what St. Elmo's fire is? Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. The whole airplane was like full of St. Mm -hmm. Elmo's fire. You never get hit by lightning? <laughs> not, I don't know. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> I can't really honestly answer that question, but we had some treacherous weather, yes. Bounced 5,000 feet, I mean not 5,000, 1,000 feet. I'm sure. You had to be on oxygen. Uh, no, we didn't use much oxygen. We, we got to 15,000 out of that oxygen. Mm -hmm. I went over into China and I was flying at 15. I didn't. Uh, mm -hmm. 
you're flying so much you're just used to the altitude. Yeah, you're unpressurized. Though. Yeah. It gets pretty chilly up there at those altitudes. Well, we had, yeah. it wasn't, not, in the, not in that area, it's warm. Is that right? Yeah, mm -hmm. high humidity and mm -hmm. heat. You know, 100 degrees all t for several months. I was even warmer than where you were in Vietnam. You think so? Yeah. <laughs> Probably. What about, uh, then, then what about nav aids? How did you, uh, you didn't have nav aids to go no. through the mountains. You were dead reckoning <coughs> in IFR con instrument flight drill conditions? All IFR. <laughs> <laughs> then you had a navigator on board? No. Did you have good help, good co-pilot? Well, sometimes. I've had, I can tell you stories about that, too. <laughs> tell us well, some. <laughs> well, I had, uh, I went overseas, I had a good co-pilot with me, and I trained, transferred him to another plane, and I got, I trained two or three co-pilots, and uh, I did get a real good guy. We worked so well together, I mean, we could fly for four or five hours at a time, and I could sleep for two hours, and he could sleep for two hours alternate. I, I had that much faith in this co-pilot. He's a good boy. Mm -hmm. He finally checked out as a first pilot. Mm -hmm. But I had one co-pilot. He was new in the squadron. I think he only he still wet behind the ears. He only had about a 120 hours total time from tr flight training and uh, everything. Mm -hmm. And um, I was on a little short strip, about three th less than 3,000 feet, and there's a drop off, you know, the strip of stream. Just like this, mm -hmm. and uh, I said to him before the first day I flew with him, I said to him, uh, "I'm going to take off now." So I got out in the line. There's trees on one end, and a ditch on the other, and the runway, so-called runway. And the middle of the runway is a, is a hump in a soft spot, sand or something. Mm -hmm. And so I said to him, "I said now, I'm going to hit the throttle, and I'm going to start rolling. And when I say flaps, or I say half flaps." Quarter flap, not half, that's too much. I want the flaps to give me the lift so I can get off the end. Well, he hit the soft spot and I asked for quarter flaps. He gave me full flaps. So I went like this, <laughs> pulled out, and I went off the edge of that cliff like this, a little drop off. And so I chewed him out a bit, back to our home base. He pulled the same trip, trick. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. For the next takeoff, we had two takeoff, two or three takeoffs that day, and uh, he knew a lot more about flying than I did. <laughs> and so, I had one more flight with him, and I refused to fly with him again. And uh, two or three other pilots refused to fly with him. Also, he knew more than the pilots did, who had thousands of hours. Mm -hmm. And so, they were he was transferred out of our squadron later. Yeah, he probably had very little multi-engine time. Right. No, I hadn't mm -hmm. been through. Well, you can get multi-engine training or single engine. I don't mm -hmm. know what he had, mm -hmm. but. Um, so, what kind of airports were you flying out of? Were were, were these gravel runways or, or the cat? Dirt, or gravel, mud, PSP, that metal, metal, metal grading. Yeah, uh -huh. we uh, at our home base, which is just over the border into India. We had about a. Maybe maybe five thousand foot strip. I'm not sure, but we had such little fields everywhere else where we dropped supplies off. We we could land and turn off in nine hundred feet. Mm -hmm. Which I mean, you you come in, you put your wheel right there, not not down here. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the but guys got pretty. I got to be pretty sharp. To, mm -hmm. All of us. But could you? Did you have some kind of uh, a landing procedure? You didn't have an aisle, an instrument landing oh, system. No, I'm no. sure that wasn't even developed yet. Yeah, you used a uh, some kind of a local. Uh, uh, you had a tower. Um, sometimes, sometimes you, you had a tower. Sometimes you didn't. Uh -huh. I lost one plane one time. Uh, we had a, we had a. It was a British field, right on the Burma border, and. Uh, we had a ceiling of about two or three hundred feet, mm -hmm. broken, heavy, heavy broken clouds and rain. Mm -hmm. And so the runway, I'd been in the runway several times. Down here was a little, pretty good sized hill. Mm -hmm. And so we usually landed this way. But this one time I chose to come in this way and land because of the hill. If I had to go around, it was safer, a lot safer. Mm -hmm. And so I called the tower. No answer. 
several times, so I decided I was going to I had to land anyhow. So I, I finally saw the runway a little bit, and so I went, went around. And as I'm final approach, just where you touched down, and the plane was taken off toward me, the other end of the runway. Mm -hmm. So I hollered to get off the runway. And I pulled off into the mud, mud about that deep, mm -hmm. and tried to ground loop. Mm -hmm. well, I turned 90 degrees, and I slid sideways a good five, 600 feet or more. And he had pulled off to his left, and I had pulled to my right. So he was on a little bit of a tiny bit of a so-called hard stand. And his wing went through my fuselage, mm -hmm. and his propeller stopped that far from my co-pilot's window. Mm -hmm. And uh, his plane, his wing fu uh, punctured my fuselage and broke my load. My load was already broken up, mm -hmm. but I had 7,000 pounds of canned sardines on board for the British troops. <laughs> 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 so my, both my planes were demolished, mm -hmm. but no one was hurt, thank God. Mm -hmm. Sardines, what other kind of cargoes did you carry? You name it, we carried it. Really? Tractors, power shovels, mm -hmm. personnel, ammunition, mm -hmm. food, and so forth. Mm -hmm. There are no roads, so we had to fly mm -hmm. it. Couldn't come in from the south because the, the Burma roads all closed. Mm -hmm. and the troops were down in southern Burma. Mm -hmm. But uh, and then I had an assignment one time. Well, we had orders to expedite the war effort. And this colonel, who was chief of staff, asked me when I could take him somewhere. So I did. And a uh, you know, heck of a nice guy. And uh, he asked for me three or four or five times to fly him to different destinations. And we hit it off very, very well. And uh, he knew I was getting reams as far as motion was concerned. Mm -hmm. He knew the story. He knew that my squadron commander, he was a real jerk. Mm -hmm. Never should have been a criminal. He wasn't a leader. Mm -hmm. he, uh, I'll tell you what kind of a guy he was. We had a mission into China, deep into China, and we had to refuel. You couldn't make it round trip in your fuel, in your fuel capacity. And so he, he had, we had two new pilots, co pilots been promoted. So they put two in each plane. And there, I don't know, I don't recall how many planes went, but uh, we all got back except the two new pilots. They crashed. They followed his orders. And the COs, he vanished for about a month. He's afraid someone's going to hit him in the back of his head with him, mm -hmm. 45 or something. And uh, he, wasn't, wasn't like, he wasn't a leader. Mm -hmm. He was rank happy, but that's all. It, and why did they crash? Fuel problems? They or? ran out of fuel. Yeah. Did you have adequate reserves, or did you feel, or what kind of reserves did you have? To, did you have enough to make it to an alternate? Uh, yes. Did you have well, an alternate? All of us, all of us did go to alternate and stop the mission on because there was fuel there. Mm -hmm. But we still had two or three more hours to go to get back to our home base. So a typical mission would be how long? It'd vary from two to five hours. Mm -hmm. Indeed. Two or three or four a day. Mm -hmm. You take off at dawn every morning before and fly until dark. And what did you do in your spare time? Sleep. <laughs> Is that right? Did you have spare time? Did you did you get an R and R or anything? Oh no, no. Uh -huh. I I flew for almost three months on a day off, seven days a week, mm -hmm. all day long. Not, I mean, I'm no different than anybody else. The whole squadron did the same thing. Mm -hmm. We flew, I don't know, better than 1,500 hours one year. Mm -hmm. That's a bunch. What, what what kind of conditions did you have at your home base? The, did you have barracks or did you have to sleep yeah, in tents? Yeah, we had barracks, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, we, uh, our base in India, we had a, uh, we were in, there were some barracks where the employees who worked in the tea garden used to sleep. The government took it over and cleaned it up a little bit and we had separate rooms, two guys mm -hmm. to a room. No air conditioning? What's that? <laughs> <laughs> How about the food? <laughs> well, sea rations. Government sea rations. Didn't you get a break once in a while? Yes. <laughs> That's you know how we get a break. We uh -huh. supply the front lines and somehow we move them from base to base or so forth and they moved up. And they would give us 
grade A food, number one food. <laughs> and there are some, some of the guys did hunting, there's there deer and, and other animals over there, and they would give us fresh meat sometimes. But they mm -hmm. had better, front lines deserved better food. Mm -hmm. They had the rougher time. Mm -hmm. You've heard of Merle's Marauders, don't you? Oh, yeah. Yeah, we got uh -huh. one of those living up where I am. But uh, then the colonel asked me to, to I, oh, the story I gave to Ruth, I mean, mm -hmm. not Janet. Janet. Mm -hmm. uh, the colonel had a uh, P-51 and there's a P-40 signed to the chief of staff of the 10th Air Force. Mm -hmm. And so this colonel and I became pretty good friends. And I said, Colonel, can I fly that P-40 sometime? I mean, P-51? So I went over to Burma to flat when I'd studied the tech orders and thought I knew something about it and enough to be checked out. And so I went over there and it was red line. I couldn't fly it. So the colonel said, why don't you fly the P-40? I don't want to fly the P-40. I don't know anything about it. I had never read the tech orders or anything. And the colonel said, Russ, with all the flying you do, you can fly anything. So he pushed me into the P-40. He said, the crew chief will check you out. So I donned my parachute and got in the plane, and the crew chief stood on the wing, briefed me on procedures and so forth. And uh, I noticed that every time I tighten the throttle brake, you know what that is, of course, mm -hmm. you, you've flown, the crew chief would loosen it. Mm -hmm. Back and forth, I'd tighten it, he'd loosen it. And so we finally taxied out the runway after, oh, probably 20, 30 minutes and uh, cleared for takeoff. You couldn't hang on, you couldn't take your time. You had to get out of the way for traffic. Mm -hmm. And it was, a, I don't remember whether it was a gravel runway or I don't think it was asphalt. Anyhow, they had just delivered three brand new P-38s parked along the edge of the runway. So I pushed the throttle and finally after, no, I'm, I'm getting ahead of my story. I crew chief jumped off the wing, I closed the canopy, and then tower said go. And so I pushed the throttle, and the throttle brake was loose. Full power. Mm -hmm. Too much at one time. Mm -hmm. And the, we had these wide blades for the warm climate, we call them butter blades. Mm -hmm. And the torque was tremendous. The plane just pulled me off right to those three brand new airplanes. And it scares me still. To this day, I can feel it. I closed, I knew I was going to be killed mm -hmm. and damaged four airplanes or more. And so I closed my eyes and prayed to God, save me. I, I seemed like I waited for a long time, it seemed like, anyhow. And, and I heard the tower say, wow. I opened my eyes, I just leapfrogged over those three airplanes and I was settling down a little bit. But I had enough lift, I didn't touch the ground. I had enough lift, so I went to 10,000 and felt the airplane out for a while, about an hour. Came back to land, entered the traffic pattern, downwind, base leg, final approach. Here's an ambulance and a fire truck waiting for me. That's encouraging. <laughs> 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 Anyhow, I did make a good landing, if I can brag a little bit. Uh, uh, a very good landing, and never flew another P-40. Uh, yeah. But the colonel, he was called to the tower uh, while I was flying around. So he, he talked me a little bit. I assured him I think I was okay. And uh, so after I made that landing, he came over and we talked. And I went back to my squadron. And about... Well, less than 60 days later, I had a message that came down from the top of the 10th Air Force to transfer me to a fighter outfit. Mm -hmm. And my CO didn't like the idea. It came from the top down. It wasn't his idea. Mm -hmm. He made some rather pertinent remarks about it. Mm -hmm. So I transferred anyhow, and I flew 40, 42 or three more missions in the fighters. It was not uh, aerial combat, it was ground air support primarily. Mm -hmm. But then um, I just get worn out flying so much. Mm -hmm. You know what that's mm -hmm. like. Mm -hmm. And so I requested 
to be transferred home, so I didn't get my rank. I was, mm -hmm. The colonel wanted me to become a squadron mm -hmm. commander for another outfit. So you spent most of your tour overseas, at overseas bases, it sounds like. Quite a bit, yes. Mm -hmm. I did, mm -hmm. well, we ferried airplanes all over the United States, too. Mm -hmm. Just mm -hmm. about. So there were lots of, do you know how many missions you flew in the C-47? A little over 200. 200 missions. 205 or six or eight, mm -hmm. I don't know. Maybe what period of time? One year. In one year? Yeah, less than a year. And I went to fighter outfit. I did all my flying in about one year. Mm -hmm. I mean, overseas. You know what the losses were during that year? Uh, well, Combat cargo, there are three squadrons. The uh, safety wreck was pretty darn good. Considering mm -hmm. the flying, it, the record was excellent. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, it's amazing. Mm -hmm. uh, the Air Transport Command, they lost a lot of planes going back and forth to China. Mm -hmm. I lost six friends, personal friends, from graduate flight training, graduate mm -hmm. training, and uh, they were lost, crashed mm -hmm. C-46s. And mm -hmm. uh, the fighter outfit we had, well, I was in it, we only lost one airplane. We thought we lost a man, but he returned. Could he, he, went, did he, he was out? He, he, she was shot down and uh, from ground support, and uh, in a P-47, we crashed and we saw flames, so we circled and came back. Mm -hmm. and, but. Uh, He showed up in about four days did later. You, did you, could you bail out of, of that C-46? Could you get out of it? If you I were wasn't in the 46. I did check one out, but I didn't. Uh -huh. As a 47 fighter, we crashed, I mean, yeah. Yeah, I mean in the C-47. Uh, could you bail out of it? Could you... Uh, we had parachutes in the back. We didn't wear them all the time. We uh -huh. had their upholstered seat seats. Uh -huh. Was and there any search and rescue uh, organization in case you did have to go down in the jungle? Yes. Not much. Uh, it Not was, much. It, it was a nasty area if you had to oh, go yeah. down. And, uh, oh, you know, actually, if you went, had to go down, you're better off going down with your airplane rather than bailing out. Because the, jung the dense jungle places, you had a, a, a little bit of protection. Mm -hmm. A plane crashed, a plane could be lost in two or three days, mm -hmm. the jungle regrows over. Mm -hmm. But if you're bailing out single individual, you could be lost uh, within a couple hours. Mm -hmm. But uh, did you do you familiar with a blood shit? Do you, the what? The blood shit. Did the uh, I, I a blood shit that was some kind of a I understood some people carry to uh, give to the natives so that you could uh, they would receive a reward if they assisted you back to a U.S. base. Uh, no, they didn't. Have any no, the plan. the Burmese people there. We were. We were involved more or less with five different tribes. Mm -hmm. They were tribal people pretty much and very primitive, except in the town of Mishina. Mm -hmm. And that was quite a battle because the, the uh, Japanese troops uh, were dug in. And for quite some time, they'd still come out of their tunnels mm -hmm. and underground. Mm -hmm. And uh, they'd make a little raft and go down the Irrawaddy River. I saw mm -hmm. some one time when I was flying a C-47. I took pictures and they all jumped overboard. <laughs> mm -hmm. I thought I was going to shoot them. You know, I didn't. In the C-47, you don't have any guns. <laughs> the P-47 is different. Mm -hmm. But um, mm -hmm. it was some remarkable flying, very mm -hmm. truthfully, because of the weather conditions and mm -hmm. the mountains and the airports we had. Well, I did a little background. It said there were over a thousand airplanes lost, and, and uh, if my number's right, over 500 pilots, if I remember correctly. Oh, most of that was and, uh, ATC, Air uh -huh. Transport Command. They lost uh -huh. more than the combat boys did. So you received, you got several commendations and awards. Can you tell us about those and what they were for? Or? Well, I got out um, of five air medals, mm -hmm. and I got uh, four distinguished flying crosses. Mm -hmm. And those are my basic rewards, plus mm -hmm. combat areas, you know, mm -hmm. like you did. Mm -hmm. Tell me a little bit about your flying. Well, I'll get a chance later. We'll okay. be <laughs> uh, so you were, 
did you have to, you had no additional duties then other than flying. Uh, That's uh, right. Mm -hmm. That's all we did, man. We flew so, every single day, many hours. Uh huh. Could you keep in touch with home, family, and relatives, no. and so forth? Were you married at the time? Or no, I was not married. Oh, uh, well, I did have one nice little experience. I got a letter from my mother. She had taken the cover off the Life magazine. Mm -hmm. It showed they're building the roads back and forth up the mountains for the Lido Road. Mm -hmm. And mother says, "Do you." You know where this is? I said I fly over it every day. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So were you there when the war ended? No, you came back before the war ended. Yes. Right? So how did you get home? I, well, that was a good experience too. <laughs> <laughs> I flew um, from Burma to uh, New Delhi, India. I spent the night there and I flew on from there down to uh, Karachi, India. Mm -hmm. We had a layover there a night, and then we got another crew of other people who were going to fly home. I was not a pilot, I was transport command. Mm -hmm. We flew from there to um, Abadan in Iran, mm -hmm. and <clears throat> we changed planes here and crews. <clears throat> the pilot of this plane we changed was a friend of mine from our duty back in Texas. We had a lot of good duty together down there. And so he was flying for the traffic transport command, and we flew to Egypt, Libya, and all these different countries, all, every major place. We ended up in Casablanca. And this friend of mine was a pilot. He said, your buddy Jess Caleb, I think his name was, is space commander in, in uh, I'm, I'm losing my memory. Uh, where did I say it was in Africa? It begins with the letter C. Uh, uh, Casablanca. Casablanca, uh -huh. yeah, thank you. And I had my, my one of my buddies from Burma, was he, two of us traveling together. And uh, so I went to see him I, after he landed. I, he'd gone off duty. Mm. But I left my name and uh, he called me the next morning. He said, what are you doing here? I said, well, I'm getting ready to go home. Did you want to fly a B-17 home across the Atlantic? I said, no, thank you. I don't want to fly a four engine, especially a war-weary plane. <laughs> so he said, come on down, bring your bags. I said, we're not supposed to leave here. Well, he said, tell him you're flying a plane home. So I went down to see him, brought my buddy, and uh, we visited for quite a while, and we had lunch, and then he said, come with me after lunch. We said, bring your bag. He put us on the next plane to the States. And we were supposed to hang around Casablanca for about two or three weeks before he get a priority to go home. But we flew directly to New York. We couldn't land in New York because of the weather, so we landed in Washington. Yeah. And in Washington, they said, what are you guys doing here? Said, we're coming home. Well, go on home then. So I didn't have to spend any time in Washington. So I went home, and uh, I, I, got, I got a leave notice, so I got a 30-day leave. And were you discharged then? No. You, uh -huh. uh, not at that time. I don't think I was. I guess maybe I was. No, I went back to Bowling Field. I flew generals for another two months. And was war over then? Or, or no, it not wasn't quite. quite. What quite? No, I was discharged from Washington uh, finally, and then the war was over. So I was home in the, on v, VJ Day. So did you go back to Massachusetts? No, back to Connecticut where oh, my family okay. was living. Connecticut, that's right. Then I went down to New York. I wasn't going to fly for a while, not commercially. But the planes going over my house in New York to Boston mm -hmm. got me. Mm -hmm. Interested, so I went down to New York and I went to TWA. I was going to go to United and America, and all three of them. I went to TWA and I threw my credentials out. And they said, When can you start? Good. So I started flying. I should have investigated the other airlines because that, mm -hmm. there's too much bickering with the airline personnel. Mm -hmm. I understand. So, how was it? How was the readjustment coming back to civilian life? It wasn't too bad mm -hmm. because over in Burma, we weren't. It wasn't rigid military. 
-hmm. It was get the job done. Mm -hmm. And everybody helped everybody. Mm -hmm. Good com camaraderie. Mm -hmm. Very good. Mm -hmm. But on balance, it's better to be home. No place like it. <laughs> living in the <laughs> living in that climate over there and being home is pretty nice. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I think we've covered it pretty well for today. I, mm -hmm. That was very interesting and very informative, and I'm really glad you came in to talk to us today. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I, I don't feel like I did anything special. But you did a whole lot special. I'm sure. I, I learned a lot. I'll uh -huh. tell you that. Uh huh. I know. Learned a lot about flying and mm -hmm. people. Mm hmm. So Very memorable years. They changed your life. Yes. How? Improved it. Mm hmm. Helped my education. Mm hmm. I met some very very wonderful people. Mm hmm. And. Uh, Help my business life. Good. Do you still keep in touch with some of those people? Are they still around? Uh, I've lost most of them. Mm -hmm. There's one fellow up in, uh, I just made contact with up just north of Montgomery. He was in my squadron, combat cargo squadron. Mm -hmm. I've tried to get together with him a couple of times. We haven't been able to make it yet. Mm -hmm. But uh, most of my friends are gone. Mm -hmm. Well, it's a good thing we get this all down and documented, though, before everybody. Well, mm -hmm. I hope so. Mm -hmm. hope I had the right continuity and so forth. No, it's wonderful. But mm -hmm. uh, it was a wonderful learning experience mm -hmm. and maturity, too. Mm -hmm. Young guys in their 20s aren't mature yet. Mm -hmm. Is that enough? Do you have everything you want to know? Mm -hmm. I think so. Okay, good. <laughs>